Praise the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer before the Bible study. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. Thank you because we know your presence is mighty here with us. Lord Jesus, we acknowledge your presence too. And the Holy Ghost, we acknowledge your presence. We're asking, Lord, that you will teach us yourself and reveal to everyone personally what we need from the study tonight in Jesus' name. I will pray that your word will come alive to every heart. I will benefit every one of us tremendously. Keep us awake as we learn together. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we are looking at Mark chapter 11, verses 15 to 19, and then 27 to 33. Mark chapter 11, reading from verse 15 to verse 19. And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple, and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers. And the seeds of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man will not allow, will not permit that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, It is written, My house is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but she have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it, and sought how they might destroy him. But they, but they fear him, for they feared him because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. And when the evening was come, he went out of the city. Come to verse 27. And they come again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, there come to him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders and say unto him, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority to do these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask you of you one question. And answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John was seed from heaven of men. Answer me. And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say, Why then did ye not believe him? But if we shall say of men, we feared the people, they feared the people, for all men count John that he was a prophet. And they answered and said unto Jesus, We cannot tell. And Jesus answered says unto them, Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. It's a very straightforward story. As Christ came to Jerusalem and he entered into the temple and surprisingly to the chief priests and the Pharisees, they felt he didn't have the authority to do what he did. What did he do? He went into a temple and the people that were selling doves and animals for their sacrifices, he drove them out. And he overturned the table of the money changers. And then he reminded them that the word of God had said, 
My house shall be called the house of prayer, and you have touched the temple, the house of God, to the den of thieves. Then he went away, and when he came back to them, they were waiting for him. And he challenged him, and he said, By what authority do you do this? We know the authority of the Sanhedrin. We know the authority of the rulers of the synagogue. And we know the authority that is coming from the political power. Where did you get yours? Is it a political authority or is it a religious authority? Tell us by what authority you do this. Because if you just come into the temple and then you draw with, with the people selling all they were selling, and then you talk about your father's house, and you're accusing us that will make your father's house a den of robbers, you must have an authority behind you. And Jesus wisely asked them, he said, I'll tell you, on condition you'll tell me something. The baptism of John, was it from God or from man? Why would Jesus bring in John at this time? Well, because John was sent to be a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. If they accepted John and accepted his message and accepted his authority, John said, this is he, is greater than who I am. And the Father, Almighty God, has sent him. And whatever he tells you, hear him, this is the one that comes to reveal the final will of God unto us. And Jesus had told them another time that John bore witness unto me. And ye were willing to go along with the testimony and the witness of John for a season. So he wanted them to remember what John had said. And then they will know where his authority came from. And he said, now you tell me. The baptism of John, the ministry of John, and the servitude of John, and the service of John, and the declaration of John to the whole nation. Tell me, is it from God or is it of man? Well, they knew it's actually from God. Because the angel came and announced his birth. And the angel came and said, this is the way he will live. And he will be the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll point the attention to Christ. He will decrease that Christ will increase. And so, if they said, oh, the authority is from God, he'll tell them, why didn't you believe John then? And why didn't you believe me? Because he testified of me. So they avoided sin is from God. If they said that the authority of John was from man, they were afraid of the people because they knew and everybody knew that John was a prophet of God. And so to get out of that corner that Jesus pushed them to, they said, we don't know whether John was of God or John was of man. That we cannot tell. And so he said, neither do I tell you by what authority I do all these things. The message tonight is titled, Religious Reaction Against Christ's Authority in His Temple. Religious Reaction. The reaction of those religious leaders that saw Jesus cleansing the temple reordering things in the temple and reminding them of the word of God, the declaration of the word concerning the temple. Those religious leaders, they reacted to that. They didn't want the cleansing, the clearing of the temple. Religious reaction against Christ's authority in his temple. There are three things we're looking at as we consider the reading. Number one, the cleansing and the authority of his teaching. The cleansing and the authority of his teaching. Number two, the confrontation over his authority in the temple. The confrontation 
over his authority in his temple, in the temple. Number three, the confirmation of his authority from the throne, from the throne of God. The witness came, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. So all the people that had been listening, they shouldn't have had any kind of doubt that he had his authority from heaven, from the throne. And the works he did, the miracles he performed, he went through the whole land, healing and teaching and preaching. And so everybody knew that the authority of Christ was from the throne of God. Point number three, the confirmation of his authority from the throne. Let's come back to number one, the cleansing and the authority of his teaching. We're coming to Mark chapter 11, reading from verse 15. Mark 11, we're looking at verse 15. And they come to Jerusalem. And Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple. And he overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seeds of them that sold those. And he would not permit, he would not allow, he would not suffer that any man whatever his profession and whatever his authority. He will not allow any man carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, sin unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations, not only of the nation of Israel, shall be called of all nations, the house of prayer, but she have made it a den of thieves. This section we're looking at, we look at it under three subtitles. Number one, the corruption of the temple. These leaders had corrupted the temple. And these religious rulers, they have corrupted the temple. The corruption of the temple. Actually, that began from the Old Testament. If you look at Jeremiah chapter 7, Jeremiah chapter 7, reading here from verse 8, you will see what they made the temple of, the house of God, the house of prayer. You'll see what they made of that temple. In Jeremiah chapter 8, Jeremiah chapter 7, rather, reading from verse 8, Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house? They lived a corrupted life, a sinful life. They lived a transgressing life. They lived a disobedient, rebellious life. And they, li they lived in such a way their transgression was not hidden. And then they'll come to the house of God. They'll come to the temple. And the Lord said, and then you come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations, the lives were abominable. Look at verse 11. Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers? Exactly what Jesus told them at his own time that you have made the house of God a den of robbers. Is it become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, says the Lord. And let's come to Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 8, Ezekiel chapter 8, the same complaint, the same observation, was noted by the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 8, 
Here we're reading from verse 15. Ezekiel chapter 8. We're reading from verse 15. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? God talking to Ezekiel, the man of God, a servant of God, the one sent by God to the nation of Israel. Have you seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. Again, this is the Lord's house. At the time of Ezekiel, we'll see it at the time of Jeremiah. Now at the time of Ezekiel, he brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were there were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worship the sun toward the east. Think about that. They came to the house of God. They came to the temple of God. Instead of worshiping God, they were worshiping another deity. Look at chapter 33, Ezekiel. Chapter 33. We're reading from verse 31, Ezekiel 33, reading from verse 31. In verse 31, and they come unto thee, as the people cometh, and they siege before thee, as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their hearts they show much love, but their heart goes after their covetousness. Number one, then, in this section of cleansing the temple, is the corruption of the temple. Number two, the concern for the temple. Jesus had concern. As he looked at the temple, as he looked at the house of God, as he looked at the sanctuary of God, as he looked at the place of divine worship, and he saw the actions and he saw the attitude, and he saw the behavior, and he saw the merchandise that they made of the house of God. He had a concern. He still had the same concern today. And actually, when Jesus started his ministry, at the beginning of the ministry, we're looking at John chapter 2. At the beginning of the ministry, he had seen the same thing, and he had cleansed the temple at that time. But they still went back to those things he had commanded them and told them they shouldn't do. John chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 13. In John chapter 2, verse 13, and the Jews passed over was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and those and changers of money sitting. And when he had made his coach of small courts, he drove them all out of the temple. And the, she and the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the changers' money and overthrew the, table, the tables. And he said unto them that sold those, take these things hence, take them away from here. Make not my father's house and house of merchandise. So you will see he had a concern for the house of God. Why did he have such a concern? Because that's exactly what was expected of the Messiah. Expected of the Son of God when he would come. Look at Psalm 69. In Psalm 69... Let's see what had been written concerning him. Verse 9. Psalm 69, verse 9. Written about the Messiah. Written concerning Christ when Christ will come. It says in Psalm 69, verse 9. For the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. That's the concern he had. 
the zeal of thine house at eating me up. And so when he saw those things that shouldn't be in the temple, he didn't say, well, that's what they want to do. I don't want to get involved with that. I come for something spiritual. I come only for the salvation of the people. I came that the people who want to believe will believe and then they'll follow me to heaven. No, the house of God was of concern to him. And what they did in the house of God was of concern to him. Because of that, he demonstrated and he showed his concern. That verse 9, for the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. And the reproaches of them that reproach thee are falling upon me. Let's look at Isaiah and look at what he told the people. He said, is it not written, my house shall be called and house of prayer, house of prayer, where people come and they pray, where people come and they connect with God, where people come, they repent of their sins, where people come and they turn away from evil and turn unto the Lord, where people come and they see the house of God as the gate of heaven, and then they prepare themselves for heaven. Look at Isaiah chapter 56, and we're reading from verse 7. Isaiah 56, verse 7, it says, Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Make them happy in my house of prayer. Get them redeemed in my house of prayer. Get them saved, forgiven in my house of prayer. Give them heavenly joy in my house of prayer. They, their, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. No tribalism for all people. No nepotism by all people. No nationalistic attitude for all people. No sectional gender for all people. For old and young, for parents and children, for youths and adults, house of prayer for all people. That's the reason he did what he did. But number three now is the cleansing of his temple. The cleansing of his temple. We should go beyond the physical building and understand that we, the children of God, we who are born again and we who have come to know the Lord, we are the temple of God. See what the Bible says. We're looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? See that. It says now, we're going beyond the building. And we're looking at, you know, the believer, the child of God, the creature of God, who is also redeemed by the Lord. It says, don't you know? Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. More than even the physical temple, the concern that Jesus had, more than the physical temple, he wants the believer who is the temple of God to be clean and to be pure and to be washed and to be so, so totally cleansed that no impurity will remain in that temple. And so he says, whosoever defiles the temple of God, it says in that verse 17, Him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy. The temple of God must be holy. The habitation of God must be holy. The one indwelt by God must be holy. Which temple ye are? Look at chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 19. Chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians verse 19, watch, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, look at that, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. That means you cannot just do whatever you like with your body, because that body, that temple, that sanctuary, that habitation of God they is, uh, is occupied by God and you must not allow anything unclean, 
anything unrighteous, anything evil, anything that is contrary to the word of God to be in that temple. It says in verse 20, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God. We're coming to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm reading here from verse 16. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Look at the emphasis in the epistles telling us that, yes, the temple was there. And yes, the temple is still here, the church building where we congregate, where we preach, where we sing, where we worship. Well, we pray to the Lord that temple is necessary because that's what brings us together to worship the God of heaven. And we must keep that temple, that sanctuary, that church building, keep it clean and not allow anything defiling, anything like litter, anything unclean in that temple, but more than the physical temple, more than the church building is the temple of God. The Christian, the believer, indwelt by the Lord. He doesn't want anything unclean, anything of transgression, anything of evil, anything of Satan in the body, in the temple of God, in a child of God. That's why he says in that verse 16, And what agreement at the temple of God with idols for ye believers, Ye children of God, and ye who have come to Christ, and you are following the Lord, ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, and I will walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's the word of the Lord, that's the desire of the Lord, that you, as the temple of God, will be clean, will be pure, undefiled, there will be no transgression so that God lives in a clean temple. The Holy Ghost abides in a holy temple. And let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, referring to you, referring to me, referring to us corporately together, that we are built up a temple of God and a holy habitation of the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 2, I'm reading here from verse 21. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows up into an holy temple in the Lord. All of us together, corporately, as the church of God, and the Holy Ghost abides in us, and Jesus dwells with us, and he says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. And the Father is with us. He says, we're built up together, an holy temple in the Lord. Look at verse 22. In whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. An habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, what is it that comes to the temple, the temple of God, that he is into the child of God, that Christ will say, I don't approve of this in my temple. I don't approve of this in the Christian human temple, in the child of God. Let's come to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 21. You are a child of God, you are a temple of God. You're a believer, you're a temple of God. You're a child of God, living and professing, testifying that you belong to God. You are a temple of God. What comes to that temple, what comes to that believer that brings defilement, that Christ will have the same concern today and want to drive out and cleanse off all those things. Look at Mark chapter 7, verse 21. For from within... Out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, 
that's cheapness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. Jesus is more concerned about his temple, about your body, and about your life. And he does not want any of these things to come into your life. If they come into your life and you nurse them, you allow them, you pet them, you agree with them, you manifest them, you're unclean. And he wants those things out of your life. Why? Because if those things remain in your life, they defile the temple, you cannot go to heaven. It tells us in Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 27. Revelation 21, verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter, and there shall in no wise enter into, there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. And I just read the list to you from the words of Jesus Christ that all those things evil in any form, evil thoughts, evil action, evil eye, fornication, adultery, pride, maliciousness, and lasciviousness, any of those things in a man. He calls himself a believer, but these things abide in him, and he exhibits them, and he demonstrates them. They make him unclean. There must be cleansing, and there must be the taking away of those things before that temple can go to heaven. And he says, and neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. What do we do if we find those things in our lives? As a sinner, you have never been born again. You are an adult. You are a young person. You are a child. But you have reached the age of accountability. The Lord knows that you know this is wrong. And you accept that in your life. And now you want to belong to God. You want to be saved. You want to be a child of God. What do you do? Look at Psalm 19. In Psalm 19, there's a prayer to pray. And when you pray that prayer, the blood of Jesus will come and cleanse your heart and take all those evil things away from you. It's for the adults, it's for the youth, and it's for the child. Look at Psalm 19. I'm reading from verse 12. In Psalm 19, verse 12, who can understand his errors? Cleanse me. I want to be the temple of God. I want to be a holy temple of God. Cleanse thou me from my secret fault. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Presumptuous sins, they are sins that people know and deliberately, habitually, they go into them. Then they have guilty conscience. They have guilty hands. And they know that the judgment of God is abiding them, is waiting for them because of that presumptuous sin. And the psalmist said, Oh Lord, I want my temple to be clean. I want my temple to be pure. Take all those sins away from me and I shall be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Deliberate sin is great transgression. An evil thing that somebody premeditates and it does is a great transgression. And the Lord wants to remove it. He wants to cleanse everything away from our hearts. How does he do that? Ezekiel chapter 36. In Ezekiel chapter 36, I'm reading from verse 25. Ezekiel chapter 36, reading from verse 25. It tells us in verse 25, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. Take that. Believe that. Make it personal in your life. Because if your temple remains unclean, 
if your temper remains defiled, if your temper remains sinful, you're not going to be in constant fellowship with him. He wants it clean and he can do it. And he has given the promise that he will do it. He said, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness. How many of our filthiness? Tell me, tell me. All that none will remain. Alcohol, tobacco defiles the temple. Take it off. And the alcohol and tobacco and cigarette and smoking defiles the temple. Take it off. Fornication, adultery defiles the temple. Take it off. And all those things the Holy Ghost has convicted you of. Look at this bad language. Look at this dirty language. Look at this pornography. It defiles the temple of God. Take it off. You confess. You turn away from them. And you ask the blood of Jesus to cleanse you and to pardon you. And your life will come anew. And it says from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. He will do it. I said you will do it. Hey, look at verse 31. In verse 31 there, it tells us that, uh, verse 33 rather, in verse 33, look at what it says. Thus says the Lord God, in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities and the waste the ways shall be builded. That's what he wants. He will do it in our lives. Look at Second Corinthians chapter seven. Second Corinthians chapter seven. We're reading from verse one. He wants you clean. He wants me clean. And he wants us clean within and clean without. He wants us clean privately and publicly. He wants our hearts clean. He wants our soul clean. He wants our action clean. He wants our behavior clean. He wants the words that are coming out of our mouth. He wants that clean. Then God will know this is my temple, the holy temple of God. Second Corinthians chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 1. Having therefore these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse. Look at that. Let us cleanse. You must present it to God. You must report it to God. And you must you expose everything to God. There's no private defilement. You are hiding your heart. It says, let us cleanse our hearts. Let, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness, all filthiness, all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. As we allow him to walk in our lives, he will do this cleansing in our lives. Purge us, purify us, and make us whiter than snow in our heart, in our soul, in our mind, in our character, in our behavior, in our interactions, men and women, boys and girls, make us clean and make us pure. That is his will. If we're just coming to church and coming to the Bible study, like those Pharisees were going to the temple and everything remained unclean, it was like a shrine. If it's like that, the Lord is concerned. He doesn't want that. That's actually why Jesus went to the cross of Calvary and he died for us to make our temple holy, pure, and clean. Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 26. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. That's the word again. That's the word again. He wants you clean. And he wants to cleanse us from every defilement that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having, wrinkle, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, you know, but that the temple should be holy and without blemish. It will make us holy and preserve that holiness in our lives in Jesus' name. First John chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 7. First John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, 
as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. He doesn't want any sin to remain. The certain sin cleanseth us from all sin. Habitual sin doesn't want that to remain. Cleanseth us from all sin. Presumptuous sin, willful sin, it doesn't want that to remain. It cleanseth us from all sin. Common sin, society sin, that's what everybody does. It doesn't want us to be like everybody else. It cleanseth us from all sin. How will that happen? Look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us and to cleanse us and to cleanse us from all our righteousness i pray this will be the day for every one of us he will do it in jesus name you see the promise he has given us there we're looking at acts chapter 2 acts chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 39 acts chapter 2 reading from verse 39 in verse 39 for the promise is unto you. The promise of cleansing, the promise is unto you. The promise of forgiveness, the promise is unto you. The promise that He will purify us and make us clean and holy, the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Anyone God calls into the kingdom, this is the promise, I will cleanse you, I'll purge you. I'll purify you, I'll make you clean, every spot, every blame, every blemish, I'll take away. The promise is unto you. The promise is unto me and to our children. I said unto our children, our children need salvation. Our youths need salvation. And it's available. The promise is for us parents and for us the children too. We're coming to point number two now. The confrontation over his authority in the temple. The confrontation over his authority in the temple. We're coming to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. And I'm reading from verse 27. Mark chapter 11 from verse 27. And they come again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, there come to him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders and say unto him, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority to do these things? They confronted Christ, the Son of God. They confronted Christ, the one that has all power and authority on earth and in heaven. They confronted him and they said, Who gave you this kind of authority? Why do you do what you do? And we need to understand that that's how they have been doing. And actually, the word of God says from the Old Testament, all the men of God, all the prophets of God, that the Lord sent unto the people, they confronted them. They wanted to know, how can you do that? Why should you do that? Why should you say that? Why should you declare that? It was their constant way of living, even from the Old Testament. Look at uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, and I'm reading here from verse 51. Acts chapter 7, reading from verse 51, and it says in verse 51, here is what Stephen told them, ye steep edge and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always receive the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. As your fathers did, so do ye. Stephen, what do you mean by that? That they challenge the authority of the prophets. 
they challenge the authority of Christ and the apostles now have come in the New Testament they kept on challenging the authority by what name have you done that by what authority have you done that let me refresh your memory and let me show you how they did it in the Old Testament how they confronted the men of God in the Old Testament and that's what Stephen was referring to you instead of accepting the word of God instead of believing the word of God they were busy challenging the authority of Christ and the authority of the messengers of Christ numbers chapter 16 in numbers chapter 16 we're looking at verse 3 My, uh, numbers chapter 16 verse 3 and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them you take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Here came Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And instead of accepting the authority of Moses, they challenged Moses and they said, How can you do that? And you think you're above everybody else. Everybody is holy. Everybody is acceptable in the sight of the Lord. They didn't want the correction and the control of the word of God coming from Moses. That's why they were pretending everybody is all right. Everybody wasn't all right. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, And Moses said to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, we will not come up. We will not come up. Is it a small thing you know, that thou hast brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey? Look at them. They said, you brought us out of Egypt. After all, Egypt was a land flowing with milk and honey. And you brought us out to kill us in the wilderness. Except thou make thyself all together a prince over us. It wasn't Moses that chose himself. It wasn't Moses that put himself in the position of leadership. But these people said, you make yourself the leader and you make yourself uh, oppress, oppress us, and you took us out of the land where everything was all right. That's a lie, Korah. That's a lie, Dathan. That's a lie, Abiram. Everything was not all right. In fact, they were groaning. They were crying unto God when God said Moses to them. But they now said, that was a lamb flowing with milk and honey. Look at verse 14. Moreover, that was not brought us into a land that floweth with milk milk and honey, or giving us inheritance of the fields and vineyards, will thou put out the eyes of all these men, we will not come up. They were confrontational, and they were they disregarded what the appointed leader over the land of Israel, what the Lord himself had appointed. They said, no, we don't accept. No, we're not coming up. They rejected the authority of Moses and of Aaron. And let's come to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 again. And see the commentary of the New Testament on those Old Testament people. How they confronted the leaders appointed over them. And in rejecting the authority of those leaders, they rejected the authority of God himself. Acts chapter 7 verse 38. In Acts chapter 7 verse 38, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us to whom our fathers will not obey. Our fathers will not obey. They said, we're also leaders. We're also people of God. And we're all equal. And don't tell me that you went to the mouth and you came now with, say, you know, the word of God and you're giving to us as you are, so we are. And so they rejected him. I pray that that kind of confrontational spirit against men of God, against the teacher of the word of God, will not be in our hearts in Jesus' name. 
Let me have the church saying a good amen. amen. Look at verse 39. To whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. The one that God had saying to get them out of Egypt and keep them out of Egypt, they confronted his leadership. Not only those people at the time of Moses, let's come to First Samuel. I'm reading from First Samuel chapter 8. In First Samuel chapter 8, we're reading from verse 7. First Samuel chapter 8, that's why Stephen said, you've always done this, you've always done that. Rejecting leadership, confronting leadership, confronting you know, the authority of God by the people, he said. We're looking at First Samuel chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 7. First Samuel chapter 8, reading from verse 7. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me. They have not rejected you, Samuel. I sent you. And so, if they reject you, it's not really you they're rejecting. They're rejecting me. That I should not reign over them. In verse 8, according to all the whole week, according to uh, all, the, all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me. As they rejected the message of Samuel, the prophet that you sent unto them, the Lord said, they have rejected me, and they have forsaken me, and they have searched other gods to do as they also do unto thee. They're doing that to me, but actually, because you are representing me, that's why they're doing that. For Samuel chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 19. For Samuel chapter 10, we're reading from verse 19. In verse 19 it says, And ye have this day rejected your God. Ye have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your, advers all your adversities and your tribulations. And ye have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore, Present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. They rejected Samuel, they rejected God. They rejected the word of God and the interpretation is they rejected God. We're coming to Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45, we're reading from verse 9. Isaiah chapter 45 Reading from verse 9, it says in verse 9, One to him that striveth with his maker. One to him, a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, a young person, a youth, an adult. One to him that striveth with his maker. It's the Lord who has made us, and he has authority over us. And we do not have any right challenging God and asking, who gave you authority? Or challenging Jesus, who gave you authority? He's our Savior, and he's our Lord. He's the one who has got to prepare a place in heaven for us, and whatever he says shall be final. Instead of challenging Christ like those unsaved, and like those uh, covetous uh, Pharisees, and saying, who gave you this authority? Come to Osea chapter 4. Osea chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 4. Osea chapter 4. And we're looking at verse 4 uh, to see the attitude of the people and interpretation of what God uh, saw in their attitude. Hosea chapter 4 verse 4, let yet let no man strive or reprove another, for thy people are as they that strive with the priest. As they strove against uh, Moses, 
And as they strove against Samuel, the habit continued, confrontational attitude and habit against the men of God, against the servants of God, against the priests of God. And look at this in verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They thought they are just resisting Christ, but they were resisting the one who sent him. They thought they were resisting only the apostles, but they were resisting Christ who sent them. They thought they were resisting the priest, but they were resisting the almighty God who sent the priest. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. See seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. That's the consequence of the people as they rejected the watch of the Lord. We're coming to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, Stephen said, as your fathers did, so are you doing. You have always done this. You have always rejected. And you have always confronted the authority of the one that the heavenly father sent unto you. You did it before. You are still doing it now. And it was going to have a great repercussion, consequence upon them. Let's look at their attitude in uh, Jeremiah chapter 6 I'm reading from verse 16 Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16 thus says the Lord stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where is the good way and walk therein and ye shall find rest unto your souls but the search what did you say what did he say I said, what did they say? We will not walk daring. Oh, maybe somebody will say, maybe they didn't know it was a message from God. Maybe they didn't understand that Jeremiah was coming from God and he was telling them, declaring to them the word coming from the very heart of God from heaven. That's when they said, okay, we will not. Jeremiah, go your way. That's your idea. Look at Jeremiah chapter 44. Jeremiah chapter 44. And I'm reading from verse 16, Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 16. As the word, as for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. They knew it was from God, but they rejected that. They knew Jeremiah was not talking all by himself. It was the revelation of God to him. And he came to the people and said, Thus says the Lord, this is the way. What he therein? They said, Jeremiah, hold on, hold on. Don't waste your breath. As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. Verse 17, but we will certainly do whatsoever sin goeth forth out of our own mouth. We are masters to ourselves and we declare that we're going to stay independent of God, indifferent to God. Let me show you one thing now. Micah, chapter 5, Micah, Old Testament, Micah, chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 2. Micah, chapter 5, reading from verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Thou, uh, uh, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. Out of Bethlehem shall he come unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. If you know this verse, who is this verse talking about? I said, who is this verse talking about? Can I hear you? It's Jesus, because it says, he will come, be born in Bethlehem. That's where he was born. And then it says, he will be ruler in Israel, the king of Israel, from everlasting. You cannot say that about anybody, even Adam or Abraham 
or Enoch or Moses or Joshua or David. They are not from everlasting. Only Jesus Christ has been from everlasting. And this verse affirms that he will be ruler in Israel. That's his authority. And when Jesus was born and those uh, wise men came from the east and they wanted to know where is Christ, they wanted to worship that Christ, and the people did not know, Herod then asked the uh, Pharisees and the scribes where Christ will be born. And they said in Bethlehem of Judah, and then they quoted this verse that out of Bethlehem he will come. He will be ruler in Israel. Notice that, underline that in that verse 2, he will be ruler in Israel. Now he has come, and he's preaching to the people, and he's healing the sick, and he's even raising the dead. And he brings them word from heaven. And he spoke with authority, not as the scribes and not as the Pharisees. Look at what they said. Look at what they said in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 14. Luke chapter 19. We're reading from verse 14. But his citizens hated him. And Jesus said, They hated me without a cause. I'm the ruler. And all that soon know it have said is the king of Israel. And the citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. That's confrontation. We will not have this man to reign over us. That was their mind. In you, they were just saying, who gave you this authority? They knew he had authority, but they had made up their minds. They were not going to accept the authority. What's going to happen to them? Look at verse 27. On the final day, when Christ will come and establish his kingdom, all those who opposed him, all those who rejected him, look at what will happen. Verse 27, and those my enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Judgment will come upon them. In the Acts of the Apostles, they continue that rejection. But you know what Jesus had said? Let's look at Luke chapter 10, verse 16. Luke chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 16. It says in verse 16, He that heareth you, heareth me. The Lord told his own disciples, I'm sending you forth, and I give you power, I give you authority, go in my name, go on my behalf. He that heareth you, heareth me. He that despises you, despises me. After Jesus died on the cross, he gave the message of salvation to his disciples. And he said, go and tell them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Everywhere you go, those who accept you, they accept me. Those who receive the message, they receive me and they'll be saved. But those who despise you, they despise me. And he that despises me, despises him that sent me. Those who still confront the ministers of God and the preachers of the gospel today, and he said, we believe Christ, we don't believe you. Well, you cannot see Christ. He has sent his messengers, and he has said, if you accept what his messengers say, you accept him. If you reject what his messengers say, then you reject him, the Lord. We will not reject the Lord. I will not reject the Lord. I will not reject his message. I said I will not reject his message. And the blessings of the message will be in your life in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. The confirmation of his authority from the throne. The confirmation of his authority from the throne. We're coming to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. And I'm reading here from verse 29. From verse 29, and Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask you one thing, one question, and answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John was seen from heaven or of men, 
answer me. That was a confirmation of his authority. Why do we say that? Come to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. We're reading from verse 33. John chapter 5. Reading from verse 33. It says, Ye sent unto John, these same people, they sent unto John, and he bore witness unto the truth. But I received not testimony from man. But these things I say that she might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to, re to rejoice in his light. Ye were willing for a time, for a season, for a period to rejoice in his light, in the truth that he declared. Come to John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, John bore witness to the very fact that Jesus Christ had authority and he came from heaven. John chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 6. And there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to be a witness of the light, capital L, and that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. And that was the true light, capital L, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. If anybody is going to be saved, it will be through that light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 13, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, but of the will, nor of the will of man, but of God. Look at verse 15, John bear witness of him. That's why he asked them the baptism of John. Is he from God or is he from man? John bear witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I speak, that he that he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. He's been for all eternity. He was before me. And then let's come to John chapter 5 again. John chapter 5. We're reading from verse 26. John chapter 5, verse 26. For as the Father has life in himself so as he given to the son to have life in himself and he has given him authority he has given christ authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man mabel not at this for the hour is coming in the which all the time the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. And they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. You see, he has all authority and all judgment has been committed unto his son. John chapter 10, we're reading from verse 40. John chapter 10, we're reading from verse 40. Concerning Christ, he has authority. And concerning Christ, his authority is from the throne of God. And his authority is from heaven. Chapter 10, verse 40. And he went away again beyond, and he went, he went away again beyond Jordan, unto the place where John had first baptized, and there he abode. Verse 41, and many resorted unto him, and said, John did no miracles, but all things that John spake of this man was true, and many believed on him there. All things that John said concerning this man, everything is true. But now really, could they doubt the authority of Jesus? No, they couldn't. I know they shouldn't. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 
28. Matthew chapter 7, verse 28, and it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Everybody in the nation knew that Jesus Christ had authority. His authority came out in everything he said. His authority came out over demons, over sicknesses, over diseases. Look at chapter 8, uh, Matthew. Chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 8. In verse 8 of Matthew, chapter 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Speak the word only. He couldn't say that to any Pharisee. They don't have that authority. He couldn't say that to any of the chief priests. They didn't have that authority. Jesus had authority on earth and in heaven. Speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed, for I am a man under authority having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth. This centurion knew that Jesus had authority over even the devil, over demons, over diseases, and over death. And I say to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. And Jesus spoke the word, look at verse 13, and Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed. Somebody there tell me. The very same hour, because Jesus had authority. We're coming to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, and I'm reading here from verse 45. John chapter 7, verse 45, then came the officers to the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? We sent you out. Take that man. Arrest that man. Bring that man here. We have to judge him. And we have come empty and dead. Didn't you go there? Yes, we got there. When we got there, he was speaking. And the authority by which he spoke, we just couldn't touch him. Look at verse 46. The officers answered, Never man speak like this man. Did Jesus have authority? I said, Did Jesus have authority? He had authority. He still has authority over men over women, over the young, over the old, over religious people, over irreligious people, over the atmosphere, over storm, over the sea, over the sky, over Lucifer, over everyone and everything. Jesus has authority. We're coming to uh, John chapter 11. John chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 39. John chapter 11, reading from verse 39. And Jesus said, Take here away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, says unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. Before he had been dead, how many days was Lazarus dead? For four days, and Jesus said unto her, Said not I unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. And he took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew you that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. All these miracles he performed, he performed the miracles that the people might know that the Father had sent him. In verse 43, and when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, Somebody shout it out. 
come forth. And he was, and he that was dead came forth. He that was dead came forth. You understand? He had been buried. He was bound. His hands were bound. His foot were bound. And then they wrap all those things all around him. And it was like, like that, like a solid piece of wood. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And then without any hand carrying him up, he actually came up. It's like this chair now in front of me, just getting up without any hand. Jesus had authority. In your life, he has authority. And everything that should not be there will come forth at the mention of the name of Jesus in Jesus' name. And he that was dead came forth, bound hands and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus says unto them, Lucima, let him go. Jesus has authority. Thank God is my Savior. Thank God is my healer. Thank God is my deliverer. Thank God the people that those Pharisees and Sadducees and the chief priests were asking, who gave you this authority? Who gave you this authority? Heaven gave him the authority. The Father gave him the authority. God Almighty gave him the authority. And he manifested that authority and they knew, and they knew. And nobody should be asking, who gave you authority? Who gave you authority? That authority still abides today. That authority will remain until the time of the rapture. And when he calls the dead, all the dead will rise up. And we which are alive will go with them in Jesus' name. Come to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Jesus has authority. John chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 36. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. The works I do, the works he did that Moses did not do, that Joshua did not do, that no prophets of the Old Testament did the works that he did. Just at the mention of saying, come forth, they came forth, that work testified of him. Look at verse 37, and the Father himself, which has sent me, has borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen a shame. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he has sent him, ye believe not. Whom he has sent him, ye believe not. Thank God I believe him. He's my savior. I believe him. He's my sanctifier. I believe him. I say for myself, I believe him. He will take me to heaven. He has all the authority, and I give him all the authority in my life, and I say, reign, Master Jesus, reign, Master Jesus, over my heart, over my will, over my mind, over my action. Let him have total authority that cannot be doubted. First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm reading from verse 24. First Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 24, then cometh the age when he shall have delivered up the kingdom, the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. He will reign. In your life, he will reign. Jesus has authority. You know what to do in your life? If you want to have authority too, and if you want to overcome every problem, you acknowledge the authority of Christ. Number one, authority from the throne. 
authority from the throne. And nothing can contradict that. And nothing can change that. That authority, when it comes to your life, it will work wonders to your life in Jesus' name. Number two, the authority of his teaching. Authority of his teaching. See how he taught. He didn't refer to, according to Professor so-and-so, according to the rabbi so-and-so, and then I take uh, what they said. They said, I say unto you, these have said, this one have said, but I say unto you, is teaching courage authority. And let the teaching of Christ have total authority in your life. Number three is the authority of divine testimony. Divine testimony. The Father bore witness concerning him. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Number four is the authority of his timeless truth. Is timeless truth. He said, the words I speak to you, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. His truth carries, us, uh, carries timeless authority. Number five is the authority over the tempter. Satan came and tempted him and said, turn days to become bread and do this and do that. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. In one word, Satan went away. And when you use the words of Jesus against the tempter, against the temptress, they will flee away from you in Jesus' name. He had authority over the tempter. And number six, he had authority over our tempter tormentors over tormentors look at that man that was coming from the tomb uh, hurting himself wanting to kill himself and wanting him to you know kind of endanger his life and jesus said in one word come out they came out that authority is still there today. Any demonic power, any destructive power, wanting to hurt your life, wanting to harm your life, he has authority over your tormentors and they will stop all the torment in Jesus' name. He had authority over the tempest, over the tempest, because he was in the boat and was sleeping. And then water was coming into the boat, and the son said, Master, Master, carest not thou that will perish? And he rose up and he said, Peace be still, it was final. Tempest in your life, storm in your life tonight, peace be still, everything is cancelled in Jesus' name. He had authority over the trees, the trees. The trees represent nations and represent individuals. No man eat fruit of thee from henceforth forever and the root dried up. Any fruitless tree in your life, fruitless tree in your family, the Lord has authority over the fruitless thing in your life. Dry up, they dry up from tonight in Jesus' name. He had authority in time and in eternity. If you surrender your life to Christ here now, in time, in eternity, when he says he opens the door, come into heaven, nobody can drive you out of heaven. When Jesus says, come in, no angel can say, go out. When Jesus said, I give you my grace, I give you my peace, I give you my salvation, I've gone to prepare a place for you in heaven, come. Come into heaven, nobody can deny you from getting to heaven. He has authority in time, he has authority in eternity. Why don't you surrender your life to the Lord more fully? And more dedicate yourself to the Lord and more convincingly and say, Lord, come and have total authority over my life. I give the reign of my life, I give everything in my life unto you. Reign without a rival, and you'll be a different man from today, different woman from today, different boy, a different girl from today in Jesus' name. Would you rise up and do that? Reign, Master Jesus. Reign, Master Jesus. Reign over my life. Reign in my heart. Reign in my family. Reign on my business. Reign on my tongue. Reign on my habit. Reign in my life completely. Reign, Master Jesus. Take authority. Have authority over everything in my life. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. And the Lord will take that authority. No evil will dominate your life anymore in Jesus' name.